Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Abrams, and I'm excited to host here today. Uh, just one quick housekeeping before we start our show today. If you are watching live and want to ask questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat, and we will take audience questions at the end. Our guest today is Dr. Michael Gervais, who is one of the world's top high-performance psychologists. His clients include world record holders, Olympians, internationally acclaimed artists and musicians, MVPs from every major sport, and Fortune 100 CEOs. He's also the founder of Finding Mastery, a high-performance psychology consulting agency, the host of the Finding Mastery podcast, and the co-creator of the Performance Science Institute at the University of Southern California. He recently released a book, The First Rule of Mastery, Stop Worrying About What People Think of You, which is out now and what we're here today to talk about. So welcome, Michael, and thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you for hosting. Excited to have you. I want to start with the book. You've you know, you've obviously had a long career. You've done podcasts. You've done one-on-one -on -one coaching. You've worked with NFL teams, but this is a very different medium. So why and uh, tackle a book? Why now? And how'd you come up with uh, this concept to, to bring to the world? Okay. So why now is because I was wrestling privately with this thing and there wasn't a name for it. I didn't know what it was. I first recognized it when I was 15 years old. And then as I started later in my life working with World's Best, I noticed that they had this thing too, but there wasn't a place to um, study it. There were no handles on it so that I could port it and understand what it was. So it was always the slippery little thing. And essentially what it was is this fear of other people's opinions. And we had fun with it. We named it FOPO, fear of people's opinions. And it's this excessive worry that sits right underneath you know, our programming, our, our, our internal programming, and it sits right underneath, and it's part of the filter on how we choose our words, definitely socially, how we dress, how we don't dress. Like it's, it's part of the way that we are making decisions in our lives. And why now? Two reasons. Social media happened. <laughs> in case anyone yeah. missed, the, you know, missed the program here. Social media happened. So now that uh, all of us have a sense of public right and so there's this public nature and we're not our brains are not optimized for what is happening to us right now our brains were programmed a million years ago uh, maybe there was an update about 200,000 years ago but we've got an ancient brain that's trying to solve modern dilemma so it's one of the reasons we're finding people are so stressed out from social media so social media is one of them the second is we are obsessed with performance we live in a a, a culture that is obsessed with performance. So when you take those two and you put them together, there's this excessive worry that sits right underneath the surface for, that, that sounds like this, am I okay in the eyes of others? And there's some ancient pre programming in our brain that's responsible for that mechanism. And it's amplified right now in a pretty radical way across the society. Yeah, you touched on a lot of things that I've got follow-up questions on. So we're going to get there. We're going to get to FOPO and performance-based, uh, you know, the social norms of that. I want to hear a little bit about the the challenge of a book versus the other mediums that you've had. Because when you're tackling a book, you don't necessarily know the audience you're going to reach. Whereas a one-on-one -on -one coaching or a business or a football team, you kind of have that. How is that challenge? How did you overcome that challenge um, of having to kind of mix and match all these different stories for a broader audience? Okay, so the origin story is I wrote an article about this thing that I was struggling with, FOPO, and I wrote it for HBR. And 12 months later, they called and they said, um, you know, like, you're, who are you? You were the number one downloaded article for 12 months in a row. Like, what? you touched a nerve. And they said, we'd love to turn this into a book and, you know, back it up with some research. And I just had a few too many alligators I was wrestling in my life, you know, around you know, business development. And so they came back around 24 months later and they said, come on, you were number one downloaded again, 24 months in a row. And so it hit a nerve. And, and because of that, it felt like I owed the science of it to be shared and to put it in, in a format that we could distribute widely, you know, and, and hopefully, mm -hmm. I, I think so many people saw that article, saw themselves in it. Like, why do I worry so much about what people think of me? Like, yes, I, I struggle with that too. And so the medium was challenging because we wanted to tell a story, we wanted to have science to back it up and then make it super applied so that it's not just knowledge, but it's knowledge for application. And mm -hmm. that's the way we went at writing this book. Yeah. 
All right, let's get into faux pas. Yeah. I think, how do you define it? I mean, you kind of gave the overview, but how would you just define this um, and its impact to, to everybody that, that is facing this? Well, there's two, I think there's an easy way to think about it, and then there's a more technical. So let's start with the easy way. FOPO shows up when you're at a social event and you don't really want to be drinking, but you're holding a cocktail just because you don't want to be the odd one out. FOPO is checking your phone at a social event so that you look like you're in demand or you're busy or you've got other things that are important in your life, right? FOPO is when you're in your closet choosing which clothes you're going to wear, you're choosing based on what you think somebody will approve of or not. You know, it's pretending to like a song or a joke from a movie when you haven't actually seen, you know, the movie or you're not familiar with the song. It's laughing at a joke that you find to be a little bit unbecoming or maybe insulting, but you don't want to stand, you know, you don't want to be kind of pushed out of the group. So th those are like very slippery ways that FOPO shows up and it, it, it informs our decisions and how we respond. Okay, so that's kind of the fun way to think about it. But more technically, it's just an unproductive obsession with what other people think of us. And it's born out of the ancient brain in modern dilemma. The ancient brain figured out survival. Okay, so we know how to survive from saber tooths and wildebeest and, and the dark ages. And so our ancestry have passed on some really nice gifts. We know how to mobilize. We know how to figure things out when it's hard or pressure filled or stressed. And, and so the other thing that, that got carried over is that if we were to do something in an unbecoming way to the tribe, if we didn't perform properly, if we screwed up in some kind of way, and you, you and I might got kicked out of the tribe, that would be a near death sentence, right? It's too hard to fight and forge and hunt and gather and protect our family. It's too much. So what we needed to do is figure out how to stay part of the pack. So we are excellent at figuring out the micro expressions of the potential rejection that somebody might be forming in their own opinion. Mm -hmm. We are excellent at figuring out, oh, they're approving of this. They like this. Let me keep going. Because safety is part of belonging. So when we belong to something, we feel safe. However, when it, it's at a compromised to our integrity, it's at a compromise to our first principles, it's at a compromise to our artistic expression, there's a great cost to it. So that's that's kind of the more technical thing. And the more fun way is the way it shows up in a very slippery way in our life. Yeah. Your your book does a really good job of breaking it down to these three sections is understanding the unmasking of it, the assessing it, and then redefining it. So I want to kind of go through that. And I think like, I, I would love to use even an example. So, you know, you mentioned, what are you wearing, the social media of it, the, you know, I, I we were talking before, I've got a blurred background, people think about the books behind you and all this stuff. Technology has almost amplified this a little bit. There is yeah. all this ability of, you know, having notifications come to your, your wrist on a, a smartwatch or things buzzing and every device around you doing, uh, telling you all these things that's just adding to that FOPO. So when you think about the evolution of that, how do you kind of like start with that unmask of like, is it just the recognition it's there that, that that's happening? Or what's the cost kind of of the amount of time I thought about what shirt I should wear today? Okay, so I, I mean, yeah, I think the answer to your point is yes. Um, that the, there, are, there are many ways to think about um, how we go about talking about folk, but I think that FOPO, the number one way to start is to just ask yourself the question, like, is this happening? And, and you might not know right now, the person might not know. So the unmasking is, is really pointing to the psychological skill of awareness. Mm -hmm. And so let's just kind of pull it back. Let's see if there's something there for you. Maybe there's not. And that's either for the, uh, my experience is those that do not have any FOPO are sociopaths. So you could be one of those, no problem. Narcissist, maybe that shows up for you. The enlightened, the full enlightened, you know, are not obsessed or worried about how well they're performing and how well, how much they're approved in the eyes of others. And then deeply purpose-based people are less concerned than, than you would imagine because they're more concerned with the purpose and, and the mission that they're on. Okay, so not to get too far in the weeds yet, unmasking is really about opening up the awareness just to say, what do you think? 
is this influencing your thoughts in any way? And I want to be really clear, Mike. FOPO is not about um, not caring about what people think. That's not that's not this conversation. This is about not worrying. So worrying is actually pointing to anxiety. Worrying about are you okay in the eyes of others? And if you're not quite sure if you're okay, your brain's dictum is to figure out how to be okay. So it sends signals, heart starts to pound, breathing changes. You know, you start to say, ooh, there's duress in my system. This is what pressure or stress feels like. What's at stake here? What's happening? Oh, I know what it is. They could be rejecting me. And so then we start to have this second game. And the second game is conforming and potentially contorting or doing something to just feel like I just need to be okay. Sometimes we leave and sometimes we just shape shift a little bit. That's FOPO. So the first order of business is just to bring it to awareness. And I'll tell you, David Foster Wallace, one of the great poets and writers says, he, he sets this up brilliantly when he says, um, there's an old fish and two young fish swimming in the opposite direction. And the old fish swims by and he says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on, don't say anything for a while. And then one of the fish finally says to the other young fish, what the hell is water? And so it's it's meant to elicit, sometimes when you just point to the water that you're swimming in, the air that you're breathing, you know, it, it's like, oh, that's the thing that we're doing. It's so obvious, it's so part of our, the fabric of how we're making decisions that until you name it and call it out, it might just be the slippery little thing that's working under the surface. And so yeah. that's the fun part of introducing this concept. Yeah, it's such a fascinating thing. I, I do love as you know, we got a comment here that the worrying versus caring is is a, a, a different piece and a very uh, good distinction. I, I want to ask a little bit. You mentioned that one group that doesn't worry as much is the purpose based uh, type of personality. You also talk in the book a lot about performance based personalities yeah. and the culture of that. Can you talk about the different types of of those you know performance and purpose based uh, personalities that you you wrote about and a little bit about how that impacts part of this FOPO? 100%. So I love that question because we are in a culture where we are obsessed with performance. Mm -hmm. And it makes perfect sense if, if not most, but the majority of people have a performance-based identity. So let's, let's open that up according to research. Um, Dr. Hopeberg, one of the original kind of um, promulgators behind this idea is that he found that there's this way that that when we start to identify our self, not with who we are, but rather with what we do and how well we do it relative to other people. Okay, so that's a performance-based identity. And let me make this really concrete, um, using a, maybe a bit of a narrative here, is that let's just pick a sport, let's pick public speaking, let's pick an art, you can fill in the blanks. Let's do public speaking because it's one of the great fears for people. Mm -hmm is that when you walk on stage and your heart is pounding, the reason your heart pounds, the reason that you've got a little extra energy or light sweat or your breathing has you know, changed, the reason that's happening is your, your body has gone into fight, flight, freeze mechanism. So it's gone into that readiness for survival. Now, what is dangerous? There is not a sniper usually in row four. There's usually not, you know, right? There's no <laughs> physical risk in those moments. But the risk comes from the eyeballs of others. So it's simply the thing that's happening behind their eyeballs, which is their critique, their judgment, which leaves the potential for rejection. So your body is turned on, it's switched on. It's one of why it's one of the great fears, you know, for most people, certainly in the United States, is that that rejection is so dangerous that our body goes into survival mode. Okay, so how do we deal with this? Or, or let me uh, draw one point forward. That's because we have attached who we are to our performance. And now all of us, my entire identity is at stake. It's at risk. So what that means is it's at risk of the approval of others. Remember, performance-based identity is your identity is based on what you do, how well you do it relative to other people. And that is... That is a surefire way to play life based on other people's hopes and dreams for you, to play life according to their standards, to play life according to 
you know, whether you're going to be accepted or rejected by them. And that that's a very dangerous proposition. I think it would be hard for most people in the Western world to say, I don't understand what a performance-based identity is. Because at a young age, we our, our elders, our coaches, our parents, our teachers, they ask us about grades. Our structure is for grades, you know, which is an outcome based on your performance. And so we're, it's just, again, it's like the water that we, we swim in. And so that's a performance-based identity. And I think it's the reason why public speaking is so hard for us. It's why it's the great fear for so many. Mm-hmm. Now, now I, think, I think what we can do is translate that to, um, if that's an on-ramp to FOPO, what's an off-ramp? One of the off-ramps would be to go from performance-based identity to purpose-based identity. And that subtle little shift is it changes the way that you think about walking on stage or being in the batter's box or, you know, a white canvas that you're going to draw your first paint stroke on or the white canvas that you're going to make your first notes on for a memo or a bio or whatever it might be. So, so the purpose-based bit is to be very clear about why you're here. Mm-hmm. What is the purpose? This is not new science. This is not a new calling for people. But the freedom on the other side of it, it starts to downregulate or, um, yeah, let's call it downregulate. It starts to uh, dampen was the word I'm looking for. Dampen that, that stingy little need for approval because what you're actually doing is you're saying, no, what matters more than approval from others is to be committed to the purpose that matters to me. And so when those folks walk on stage, they come from a different orientation. If any of the world greats, Mike, were here with us today, Mandela, Mother Teresa, fill in the blanks. If any of the world greats were here, I doubt they would be nervous if we were going to approve or reject them. They are Mm -hmm. so committed to what matters most to them that they're all in. And they're working from a place from clarity, clarity of ideas, with conviction. Okay, now that, that arc from clarity of ideas to conviction is something that we spend a lot of time with in elite sport. And so, so you want to know what you need to do. You want to practice that under high stress conditions as often as you possibly can. And then when you're over the mound, when you are fill in the blank, wherever that high stress moment in sport or business or art is, that you're able to settle into that moment and have conviction to see the ball, conviction to listen to your colleagues speak or your supervisor or your direct report to solve the thing that you're trying to wrestle down to make sense of. So from clarity to conviction, and what sits in the middle between those two are mental skills, psychological skills to be able to navigate that emotionally charged moment. So Mm -hmm. clarity to conviction in between is where psychology shows up. And we can train our mind, Mike. We can train our mind just like we can train our body, just like we can train our craft. And that's what world's best in sport have been doing for a long time. And big sport is about 10 to 15 years ahead of big business when it comes to investing in the, in the ability for their people to be their very best. Mm -hmm. And so it's an exciting time because it's starting to, it's starting to work its way into, you know, multinationals and, and large business and medium sized businesses. Like I want my people to be their very best. What, what are the best practices? Well, what can we borrow from the world of sport? And certainly the crosswalk doesn't work between business and sport in many ways, but the investment in their people to live fully in the present moment, to adjust to hard scenarios, to be great under emotionally charged moments, to trust themselves, to be a great teammate to somebody else, to have clarity of purpose and to commit to it. That is a, that is a playbook from, from sport that I think we can all Mm -hmm. work from. So I want to stick with that on the sports piece, because there's a lot of conversation about how do you practice that moment? You know, the last second shot in your driveway isn't the same as 18,000 people staring at you and millions watching on TV. So how do you in the preparation bring that moment to get that mental ability? And and I would say, let's take it also to the business world of if you're going to go deliver this big presentation, how do you practice it in a conference room? to get through that mental state, to be able to go deliver when it's the high pressure situation? I love the question. So let's frame, let's frame something in a way that allows us to actually answer that question in a thoughtful way. 
is that um, you and I are, for the most time, not doing a public grandstanding type of thing. And that's what sport is doing, like a million people plus watching every night, whatever. Mm -hmm. But what's happening for them is that they, they are using their mind to be fully focused in this moment for them, whatever that moment is for them. And so maybe a million people plus are watching, that's noise. How many people are watching is noise. Even the outcome that could happen to from that moment going poorly, the potential outcome is noise. So signal to noise ratio, it's an engineering term that we're all familiar with. It's also psychological. So our job, true masters of craft, are able to use their mind to be tuned to the signal and they get out the noise. So the signal is the present moment. That holds true for game seven of, of whatever championships, the finals of this, that, or the other, the Super Bowl, the um, gold medal moment in, in the Olympics. It is marked by, can I focus deeply in this moment on the task at hand? Can I manage emotions well? Can I solve something that is complicated to solve? And that's using psychological skills, okay? Now you, you cross what, crosswalk that over to our everyday kind of hallway, boardroom, meeting room life, it's the same thing, which is, can I use my mind to focus deeply in this moment? Whether people are watching, whether the stakes you've, whatever the stakes are, all of that is noise. Can I focus my mind down to this moment? And I'll tell you why the present moment is so important. Yeah, be here now, the now, da, 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 all of that kind of pop psychology stuff that floats around. I nod my head yes, but then we need to double click to say why. Why is the present moment so important? The present moment is where the unlock happens, okay? It's where high performance is expressed. So if you're not skilled at being in the present moment, you're not yet in the game of high performance. You're not there. You're definitely not on the path of mastery if you don't know how to use your mind to be tuned to the present moment. The second thing about the present moment is that that is where wisdom is revealed. So those insights that, that go, oh, that's how this works. And that happens by being tuned deeply to the present moment. And the third is it's where all things that are beautiful and amazing and, and uh, wonderful are experienced. So the present moment is the keyhole. And that's where, again, psychological skills training shows up in payloads to know how to focus your mind in the present moment, even when there's a lot of noise around you. And sometimes, sometimes the noise is more is louder that's coming from inside your own head as opposed to the noise of the world around you mm -hmm. I, I i love the self-help kind of piece because i think that you you know there is this it is in the word self-help is the self piece of that but you're almost yeah. looking at it from the other side which is what is the the viewpoint of others and how to almost ignore that or put that noise away so can you talk a little bit about like how do you view this part as part of the self-help industry, but also the aspect of it that comes from an external factor? Okay, so I've got some challenges with the self-help industry. Um, one is because, and I know where I sit in it. So <laughs> this is like, you know, um, sitting in the own, my own, you know, boiling pot. But the self-help industry um, is focused on the self for the most part. I mean, that's where it earned its label. And we are more like, meaning humans, we're more like a coral reef than we are like individuals nailed into a, a board. You know, so we are intricately connected. And there's a fabric to um, how well you're living your life and how that impacts other people. If you're anxious, pissed off, if you are um, an irritable person, your people feel that. They, they, they are now managing something in their life based on your inability to, to work in, an, in a graceful way with the present moment. And so we are so intimately connect. It is remarkable. So what I point to instead of self-help is help yourself for one reason, so that you can be there for other people, so you can be a great teammate. And, you know, in business, we talk about, you know, the science of, of teams. Yes. Wonderful. But what that drills down to, and I've seen this play out over and over again with world championship teams, whether it's the, the Seattle Seahawks when we won the, you know, the, um, the championship there, gold medals in the Olympics, is that it comes down to being a great teammate. 
to be a great teammate, you can't be always working through your drama. You need to have a way that you're working in the present moment where you're here fully present so that you can be there for other people. So that, in other words, have your life vest on so that you can help the other. I mean, that analogy holds up so beautifully in so many ways. So I hope that answers it just a little yeah. bit. I want to, um, you know, you talk about Olympians and I think, you know, you wrote a little bit about the spotlight effect and that's a, probably as extreme as you can get in the moment of that. And there is a history of depression and mental challenges for Olympians after their time finishes. So I, I would, you know, how does your research and your experience of this FOPO kind of fit into that kind of phenomenon that's happened so frequently with such a population of people? Um, so is the question, how have I seen the, the um, yeah, I kind think of when the circus leaves town. Yeah, after, exactly. Yeah. I, okay. I'll say this just to maybe set the mood of it. Last 25 years, I've been fortunate to work with some of the world's best across multiple sports and disciplines, art, sport, business. Okay. I think if you knew what I knew about the cost, the dark side of high performance, I think you wouldn't be challenging, I'm not saying you might, but I think people wouldn't be challenging their kids in the way that they are. Mm. Because it's not, it's, not just, it's not just the ones that get there and flash out or that get there and lose their way. And then 87% of people within two years of leaving the NFL are broke, divorced, both. Uh, you know, their life is upside down. And that the NFL stands for not for long, right? That's the inside mm -hmm. joke. So it's not just the ones that get there and then have a hard time leaving, which again, 87% to that number. Um, it's all of the, the dark side of getting there where people lose their way. And when I say lose their way, it's that they, they don't recognize who they are outside of how special they can perform. And, and it becomes this deeply constricted narrowing of sense of self because a performance-based identity is narrow. It is, it's not beautifully big and, and bold and creative and taking up space. It's very, very narrow, even when you're one of the greatest in the world. Evidenced by some of our greats, you know, their brands. Look at the brands that they point to. You know, like I'm more than an athlete. And like they're, they, they're, they're scratching for something to say, I, I am more than just what I do with a basketball. So there's a dark side on the on the way out. There's a dark side and a deep cost on the way in, and that we have not squared properly how to deal well with stress, how to deal well with performance-based identity. We are in an energy, a human energy crisis, and that was that was coined by a CHRO that I deeply respect. We are in a human energy crisis, not because the world is turned upside down. Again, the dark ages were hard, like. <laughs> I don't want to go back there. I would rather wrestle with some of the things we're wrestling with now globally than that time. Um, okay, so yeah. why do humans have an energy crisis? It's because we haven't figured out how to use psychology, how to use the science of how you become your best version. We haven't used that science properly because we're still trying to beat back the, the, um, the stigma around psychology. And that, that's changing. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate we started there, but we need people like you to highlight just how powerful and wonderful it is when you can learn how to become more aware of your thoughts and emotions and feelings, more aware of what's happening outside of you, their thoughts, emotions, and feelings, and then be able to eloquently adjust. Like that's radical. Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a radical, that might not be a greater lever you can pull in modern times than understanding how to work from the inside out. And that's why we call the book, The First Rule of Mastery, how to work from the inside out really is what that's about. Yeah. So if you, you know, you're talking about stress anxiety, you wrote about burnout and those types of concepts that are happening. What would be the number one thing you'd say if someone's watching this and they're feeling that stress, they're feeling that anxiety, what's the number one thing? Where would you tell them to start? Well, first, just kind of scoot your chair back from the table and, and think through like, am I, um, Am I playing the second game? And is that mm -hmm. second game a private game where I'm trying to be liked, accepted, okay in the eyes of others? Do I have a fear that their critique or judgment is a full-on assault on me? Am I sensitive to rejection? Do I take feedback well? 
am I a wet noodle that I'm just hoping people will approve of my work and or me? So just take a look at that and see if that is part of your, your DNA or your makeup, I should say, not your DNA. And if it's not, no problems. But the other piece is that um, we want to make sure that um, you are using the best practices of recovery because all of us are in a high stress life. All of us are. There's so much happening. If we're not recovering properly, I mean, it's a tough way to go now. And I'm not talking about try to get your best sleep in on the weekend and try to get eat healthy on the weekend. I'm talking about thin slicing every day, like be disciplined and great at recovering from the stress. The second is that many of us are very expensive organisms to run exponentially expensive because we have that second game because we, the tension underneath the stressful environment is, am I going to make it? Am I going to figure it out? Is she going to approve? Like what happens if, and that's a very expensive organism to run. So anxiety, depression, addiction, other maladies that you're working from the inside out, they make it very expensive to be you. And so we end up being tired at, I don't know, noon as opposed to tired at you know 9 p.m and so that that's one way to think about it yeah i really liked in the book there's one part in the that first part of your answer was that put yourself in the receiving end of that and how much did you pay attention how much did you notice of that and you're worrying so much about thinking when you're on the other side of that how much everyone's watching it's like you're probably not paying attention to all that either so stop yeah. worrying about it and i thought that was such a practical immediate quick way to kind of just put yourself immediately in the flip situation. Yeah, you're referring to the spotlight effect mm -hmm. that uh, Professor Gilovich introduced. Yeah, it, the idea is that most people um, think that they're kind of in the spotlight when actually we're not, <laughs> you know, yeah. people are not really paying attention. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, Mike, like, does any of this show up for you? Like, is this something that you can recognize in your own life? And if, if not, like, that's cool too. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, we were, you know, before we started, we, we talked about just even this event. Like I thought about what I was going to put on to wear. I thought about my background. I thought about um, how the day was going to go and managing energy to, to be here, knowing that this is going to go out to millions of people uh, potentially versus, you know, it's the public speaking of that um, versus, you know, other things in life where, you know, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't read the comments. I'm not going to pay attention to that stuff, but that stuff exists. And I think there's that future aspect of it, which is this conversation is super fun and in the moment, really, really interesting and, and powerful. But then it's the after, like this lives on now. This is where the social media, YouTube, this will be on, on the internet for a while. And so there is that future potential. But then I think back to the spotlight of how many do I watch and do I think about what the moderator was wearing or all the other pieces of that. And that's kind of where it yeah. gets into it. And, you know, I appreciate that, Mike, I, I, making, making it real and bringing it home. And, you know, and it's, I would say um, it's a little sloppy for in my, in the way I've described this to you is that we shouldn't think about what we're going to wear. Of course, that's, that's like, it's okay. But when we, when we conform in such a way that we no longer are bringing ourselves forward and the decisions like in the closet, let's do that is like, you know, will Mike, will Mike like me or will somebody else approve of what I'm wearing as opposed to what do I feel good in? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what, how do I want to um, feel in my clothes as opposed to like, so it's the inside out mechanism as opposed to the outside in. And so that's a little bit the difference between worrying and caring. And then there's, you know, right on the other side of it is, is letting both of those fade to the side and then just tuning, you know, like what is right for me here. And if that goes with clothes, obviously that's cool, but also with the words that you're going to choose when you're in a hard conversation. And so again, it's, this wouldn't be about like, don't care about their experience because we need more empathy. Yeah. Right. That's not what this is. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's all of that excessive worry, both before the engagement and then after the engagement. And so the car ride home and the car ride there, you know, are like, they can be really stressful. And it's this private little experience with ourselves. It's the second game. It's the, the extra worry that sits underneath. And there's freedom on the other side of it, Mike. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I've worked my way through it. Like I'm finding more freedom than I ever have with it. But um, yeah, so thank you for making it real for me too. 
Yeah. So um, just a reminder uh, to throw in some questions here. We'll take a couple. Before we do that, I've got a couple more I want to ask you. I think one is I really liked the um, the idea of a litmus test of a, of a life well lived. You kind of wrote about that yeah. in the book. How would you like, how do you view that as a principle of like, when you look back at the end of life, is it, you know, like it had just, I would love you to dig into that. Like that, that was such a, an interesting topic to read about. Yeah. So the litmus test, um, you know, it's pointing to some of the work from the Stoics and, um, you know, when you start to hold FOPO up against awareness of your mortality, more, your morality, I'm sorry, your mortality, um, it's kind of, it, it becomes absurd, you know, of just how, how disconnected we are from who we are, who we want to become, being okay with ourselves. And because we, st we start to say, I'll see you later, later, let's, we're planning for the future. All those things are great, but we don't really know how much more time we have. So the ultimate litmus test is, um, if there was a shot clock on your life and absolutely you knew that time was expiring in 365 days, in 12 weeks, in, you know, 10 years, and you work backwards, how would you design your minutes? How would you design mm -hmm. your days? And that's the litmus test. We don't know. We pretend like we know. We pretend like tomorrow is going to happen, but we don't know. So we're a bit sloppy. We think we're going to have plenty more at bats, but we don't know. And so that's the ultimate litmus test is like, if you knew where the shot clock was going to time out, how would you design your life? And so we just had some fun with that. And, um, you know, it's, it's ways to think about how you're organizing your experience in the present moment. And yeah. I don't want to live with regrets. I've, I have plenty of them. I don't want to change the regrets I have because I'm, I'm trying to do my best to learn from them. But I know I can be better tuned to the present moment because I don't know, I fully embrace, I don't know when it's going to end. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way to think yeah. about it. All right. One more fun question before we open up to the audience. Ones. Was that like, said, that was a fun question? No, like, no this is, this is the, fu this is the fun question. I said one, okay. yeah, I guess this is the fun question. That was not the fun question. That was <laughs> yeah, a serious no. one to end. This is my yeah. fun one. You were uh, with the Seahawks during the Legion of Boom era. Yeah. How do you think they thought about FOPO? Did they think about FOPO or they focused on what FOPO meant to other people about them? Like that was such a fun time of football for, for that group. Uh, the Legion of Bo yeah. The Legion of Boom were for folks that don't follow um, American football. It's um, it was a handful of some of the, Oh, did I just freeze? I think you're still here. Okay. Yeah. On my side, I'm frozen. Okay. So the Legion of Boom is like this incredible um, defensive talent that really drove the team and they were big and they were bold and they were like um, highly skilled and they had a mindset that was different and um, boom, meaning they're hard hitting, you know, boom, meaning they're in your face, boom, meaning a lot of things. But what, what, what made them very special is that they were committed to each other. And I'll tell you how, how we think about that. And they were committed to a shared mission and a shared purpose. And so those two things are really important. So how do we, how do we know they were there for each other? There's this little thing that they would do in every moment before games, or I'm sorry, not every moment, before every games, is that um, they would get in their little huddle and then one of them would say, we all we got. And the rest of the team would say, we all we need. We all we got, we all we need, we all we got, we all we need. And that idea is that we are here to be great teammates for each other. So that was kind of the, 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 the um, very powerful part of it. And the second is they were very clear that their mission, their shared mission was to help each other be their very best, period. And so it was so clear, there, there wouldn't be one person on the Legion of Boom that wouldn't go, yep, that's exactly it. We're, our job was to be our best and help our, our brother in it be their very best. And so what, did they have FOPO? It didn't show up that way. <laughs> it, did, it did not look that way. Um, there was something very powerful about how they approach life. And it's very inspiring what they're able to create, which is one of the best in the league. Yeah. You know, full stop. So fun to hear about them and Super Bowl champions. So, all right, let's pull up uh, a couple audience questions here. 
So the first question is, professionally, this applies as well. Layoffs are real. People are judged by optics and metrics-based performance. When and where does corporate culture meet purpose versus performance? And this is from Jenny. Okay, so where, where purpose-based companies do it right is that they spend that intellectual horsepower to, to get the right words on the wall, to clarify in a nice sentence or two or a couple words what their purpose is. Awesome. And you're exactly right that you... We all are responsible for performing towards that purpose. And so this isn't about like hiding from performance. This is about decoupling who I am from what I do. So that decoupling is the freedom and the responsibility in many cases of adulthood for us inside of the organization is to not have what we do define who we are. Okay, so we pull it apart. And then that way we are in, in better service of the purpose of the organization. We give ourselves a chance to have better performance because we're not playing that secondary game of anxiety, which is, am I okay based on how well I perform? I am okay. I matter. I feel good about who I am. And I'm able to bring all of me to the purpose. I'm sorry, all of me to the performance and that performance whatever that excellence that I'm trying to achieve is, is in service of the purpose. So if you get that right, and that is how some of the best organizations, um, definitely in sport work, and I've seen it across you know, multinationals as well, trying to conquer um, you know, that, that internal organism about how do we bring our best part forward? How do we bring our very best assets, which for the most part um, is the humans inside of it, are the humans inside of it. Awesome. All right. We're going to pop our next question. Seems a lot of dealing with this uh, personality dependent, which may arguably give extroverts an advantage. Where is a good place for introverts or even those with social anxiety to start? Great question. This is not personality um, infused here. That's not what we're doing. This is not a personality. This is not, we are not pointing to introversion and extroversion we are pointing to the relationship that we have with others, period. That's all people. We are, we are social animals. We are not individuals masquerading you know, uh, in this world like that we're separate from the pack. We are social beings first and foremost. So introversion means how do you gather energy in the world? Extroversion is, I'm sorry, introversion is how do you gather energy from within yourself? Extroversion is the way that you gather energy from being around other people. It does, it does not mean that introverts are um, more anxious or have social anxiety. It, 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 introversion is pointing to the way that we make sense with the information that comes in. A cartoon character of an introvert is like um, big eyes and big ears because we're taking in information first and then mulling it around and then we choose to share it. What is where FOPO does pay dividends is that for both introverts and extroverts is, are we able to express ourselves clearly? Are we able to bring our most authentic, creative, problem solving ideas forward without worrying about what do they gonna, what are those others going to think of me? But it is, there's a purity in bringing yourself forward. Um, I'm sorry, bringing your ideas forward because you find this freedom that I am not just my ideas. I am not just what I do as a performer. I, I am separate from that relative to the, the, or related to the first question that I answered there. So um, I, social anxiety is a clinical disorder. FOPO sits right underneath of it. It's not clinical that you need some sort of um, diagnosis for it. It doesn't meet the criteria for that. So social anxiety is, is uh, a clinical disorder that is well-researched. FOPO sits right underneath it, which, which is just an excessive worry, but it, do, it doesn't stop you. It just makes it, um, there's more friction in how you work in social settings and um, how you feel about yourself relative to your performance. Uh, last question is also from Jenny. We're pulling it up here. How do high school students that are self-motivated, brilliant, and amazing manage their academic and social activities for college entrance and acceptance? Um, and it's a very stressful time for that group of students. 
there are people's opinions in our lives that matter. They hold weight. They can deeply influence our path forward, like head coaches to sport organizations, like uh, academic um, gatekeepers, supervisors. There, there's plenty of folks that their opinion of you will materially matter. This comes down to the signal to noise ratio again, is that you can't control what they're going to think about you. Intellectually, all people know that. So from an intellectual standpoint, knowing that you can't control what they can, what can you control, okay? So that's the work is to get down into the signal, get into the things that you can control. The things that you ultimately control are very simple. You can control your thoughts. You can control how you respond. You can control your attitude, you control your effort, you can control your preparation. You can control how much you are authentically bringing yourself forward. So we're not interested in just controlling the controllables. We're interested in the path towards being able to master those things. And people who are true masters of self or masters of craft, they are doubling down, tripling down on the things that they can control, again, opinions of others is not one of them. And so they are working to be great at what they can control, like great with your thoughts, great with uh, the way that you respond, fill in the blanks. And that all comes from an investment. You invest in your own psychology, you go upstream. You are now playing uh, a, a different game in life because you're not constantly finding yourself in the rapids of life. You've gone upstream because thoughts and emotions together impact behavior and thoughts, emotions, and behavior together impact performance. And if you're in, in the rapids of like, is my performance okay relative to other people in the eyes of others, it's so convoluted and messy. It's like, what do I grab onto? It's quite simple. Go way upstream, invest in having quality thoughts that serve you authentically and are in service of your purpose. You do those two things, you find a sense of freedom in life. and we need our next generation of kids to do just that. They have to show us now. We haven't gotten it right. We, when I say we, I'm talking about the, you know, the generation that I am, I'm 50 years old, so it's this generation and a little bit younger and a little bit older. We haven't gotten this thing right. So we need that next generation to own that my job is to work on mastering the things that are in my control and pour into those and do it with a sense of kindness and empathy and purpose. I think that the world is calling for it. And I think they're up for the challenge. And so are we, you know, it's just a slight switch here. And so, yeah, thank you for that question as well. Amazing. Uh, Jenny and Alan, thank you for your questions. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time and be here and join us today. Um, it's been super fun uh, to have you. And thanks everyone for watching. Be sure to check out the book, The First Rule of Mastery. Stop worrying about what people think of you uh, wherever you get books. Thanks everybody.